Yeah. <laughs> He's got everything. Well, think, man. I was I was a Dolphins. Well, sorry, I'm, I am a Dolphins fan. So I played against Tom Brady for the last 15, six, or my team played against Tom. <laughs> I was there. Yes, I got to count it. Go. Part of that team. But for the last 15, 16 years, right? And just getting smoked and dusted. And naturally, when you're a bit younger, it's like, there's all this resentment towards the guy. But you, when you get older, and you, you can just appreciate what he's doing. Like at, at this yep. point in my career, or in their career, sorry, I'm rooting for a guy like Brady to win more championships. I'm rooting for a guy like LeBron James. Like I want to see a legacy I, grow. I, I love, I, I love it. I, I just like when you, you got to put a couple things in perspective and really think about it. Number one, the guy has seven Super Bowl rings. The next closest is the Pittsburgh Steelers with six. So, you know, when you put that in perspective in new England has six as well, but you put that in perspective, this guy has more titles than any franchise. And that was what Super Bowl 55 that we just watched. Yeah. So that's number one, right? Number two, this guy was in New England always every all the haters always try and find some bullshit reason to excuse a victory. Right. It's always oh, he deflated the balls. Oh, whatever. He fucking, you know, drug the other team's water, whatever this bullshit reason is. The refs were on his side. He gets all the calls like so year after year after year. And, and you made excuses for three Super Bowls, then four Super Bowls, then five, then six. Then he leaves New England and everybody goes, ah, he's fucking done. He can't win without Belichick. He's gone to Tampa to retire like all the old people do in Florida. Goes and pops his head in the dressing room, goes, hey, fellas, you want to win a Super Bowl? Gotcha. And goes and wins the fucking Super Bowl at 43 years old. How do you – how can you not look at that and just put your hands up and go, I, I give up. You're the best. You're – like no one has done anything even remotely close to what you've done. Like yeah. it's incredible. It's yeah. incredible. Well, think about that. It's like, it's like if MJ – and MJ, what MJ's credentials are and what he did is like obviously unmatched too, but it's not like he – left and went to the Washington Wizards and won a championship there, right? And again, I know that's a massive difference, but I'm just saying, like, no one's done what Tom Brady's done. Like, no one no. left the team at, clearly at, like, probably like their their lowest point in their career in terms of age, at least, and led a team to a championship, right? Like, it's just, it's like, yeah, their, their team is stacked, they're good, but I guarantee they wouldn't have won it with James Winston. Like, they wouldn't have won the championship. <laughs> like, it is what it is, right? Like, you, yeah. Had I think Tom Brady I think a telltale a telltale stat, man. Like so last year the Bucks are seven and nine, right? Then they go, Tom Brady goes, and yeah, Gronk went too. Fine. But I mean Gronk's old too, man. You oh, know, he's, and then he's so, young. He's just he's just what is he beat up. He, what's Gronk? 20, 33, 20, 34? 20, 29, 30. No way. Is he that young? Yeah, man. He looks like he's, he looks like he's 41, but regardless of whether or not, regardless of who, who went with him, Right. So you have, you have Tom Brady who goes, he goes over to, to Tampa at 43 years old, takes a team that's seven and nine brings home a Super Bowl title, former team, new England finishes the year seven and nine. I think I'm pretty sure on that, but regardless, like you watch those teams, it was almost like that one player. It was just like that old adage, right? There's no bad teams. There's only bad leaders. You have a good leader. You can put him in any team and he's going to be successful, right? Like that guy is a leader. That guy takes other people around him and makes them significantly better at what they do. And he does it with ease. And he was able to, at 43 years old, at an age where most people are long done, long done, dominate dominate the former Super Bowl or last year's Super Bowl champions. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah it's wild. And 50 touchdowns in the regular season, right? And and a great influencer, man. The guy brought over or brought Gronk out of retirement. That's, that's the only way Gronk was coming out was to play as Tom Brady. Um, you know, brought yep. Leonard Fournette over, brought yep. Antonio Brown out of insanity, right? Which, <laughs> seemed, which, which seemed like it was going to be impossible. Like the guy literally lost his mind eight months yeah. ago. And for him to want to play with Tom Brady and kind of get his shit together, I'm not saying he was a huge asset necessarily, but he's still, he's still Antonio Brown. So, you know, like that's, that's huge in his own, right. His own right. Bringing those guys over that want to play for you. And that's a big thing for a leader. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do what this. We got? What are we, what are we talking about today? You got it written on that whiteboard behind you. Is that where it is? Oh man. On the little book in front of me, the whiteboards for, extra special occasions you know? that looks like oh, that looks know, like uh, extra but you ever watch homeland that looks like carrie's wall that's with all the strings attached yeah don't reference the, the people don't, who don't get the homeland. reference but i know the show I've heard there the you show. go um who, who's the star of that one uh claire danes claire danes yeah 
not, you're not selling me on it, but okay. It's good. No, it's no good. I know. I, I heard I heard it's good. I heard it's good. I know I'm watching. You'll, you'll, right. pre- you'll appreciate this. Sorry, before we get in. Um, I'm starting to watch Parks again. Parks and Rec. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Great show. Beauty show. Five, five, five episodes in. Loving it. I already, yeah. already watched it, but like this will be my second time around, so feels fresh. Ron Ron is one of the greatest characters in TV history. <laughs> he likes his bacon wrapped shrimp. <laughs> All right, well, let's, do, let's do this thing. All right, guys. So the episode today, we're looking at five common fitness and health trends that need fixing. Okay. So this is a good one. <clears throat> Obviously, Matt and I were thinking about what a good topic would be to discuss. Matt's basically become the Ancaster ranter. So he'll, he'll go on Instagram and he'll really kind of debunk some stuff. And, and it's all credible stuff. It's all stuff I agree, agree with. Um, and I think it just gets to the point that you see a lot of dumb shit being done by people or, or wrong stuff being done. Um, and that can just be from, you know, wrong information being read or reading one source and completely blindly following it for the rest of your life. So our role and intent today is to provide a little bit of that insight of how to take some of these common fitness and health trends and make them advantageous for the everyday worker out or exerciser or human being. That way you can maximize your training, you can maximize your health, maximize your performance. That's kind of the goal of this one, right? To make sure you're doing stuff properly and not going down a path or road that's going to get you to failure uh, a lot sooner, right? We want success here. So number one, we're going to start off with elimination diets okay so elimination diets i'll kind of just give you a broad understanding and perspective of what that is it's basically we're eliminating a certain food or eliminate eliminating something from your diet you can't touch this some common popular examples would be the ketogenic diet okay very very low carbohydrate diet around 50 grams of carbs or less then you have the paleo which is obviously very low carb as well, more of a caveman diet. So think about what would a traditional caveman eat back then? What would he have had access to, right? Meat, nuts, berries, fruits, vegetables, that kind of stuff. Then you have your vegans and your vegetarians, which obviously don't eat meat. Um, Then you have the carnivore diet, which is you're eating all meat, right? So zero carbs, um, basically foods that only walked, swam, or flew, you're eating. And then you can eat some lard and bone marrow, all that kind of stuff. So those are elimination diets, right? And from a long-term health perspective, Matt's, I can see he's chomping at the bit. He's ready to jump <laughs> in this now. Okay? Um, elimination diets tend not to work very well long-term, right? Because our body works as a whole ecosystem, right? Just so to clarify, fats and proteins are absolutely essential. You need those to live. Yes, you don't, carbs are not essential and that you won't die if you never eat another carb again but they do provide us a ton of healthy benefits. So I'm going to let Matt kind of go into this one. What are your thoughts? Obviously we know elimination diets aren't a good thing long-term for specific people. I always like to say it depends. A ketogenic diet might, de- might be better for one individual than the other. And there might be some you know benefits to the carnivore diet, like fighting off depression, arthritis and diabetes, all that stuff. But why are elimination diets not the best thing for the majority of people? Go ahead, bud. Oh, this is a big, big topic to tackle. <laughs> um, first of all, I'll start by saying that no matter what we talk about here and no matter what my opinion is, um, I am not recommending that anybody run out and try anything that I say without doing your own research first. And I think that is a point that needs to be made uh, because I think people are far too easily influenced by uh, something they've read, something they've watched, something they've heard, something someone they trust has told them. And I also think on the flip side of that coin, a lot of coaches um, are borderline negligent and reckless when they're prescribing certain diets to certain people. And I think I think it's on other subjects. And I think it's kind of a situation sometimes where it's like, you need to know when it's your turn You know what I mean? And if you are not, if you don't have years of practice and helping people with their diets, I think as a 23 year old male coach, for example, to tell a female who's had three children to go on a keto diet is fucking reckless. 
I think that that's, you know, I, I think that you lack a very fundamental understanding of how the body works and of human nutrition. So that's, that's all, I'll preface everything by saying that I think that we are far too easily influenced. And I think that we trust people too easily. Um, elimination diets, though, we can take them, we can just talk about them back and forth if you want, but they're, they're almost set up to fail from the beginning. And there's, I think the most, for the most part, people are always looking for a solution to a problem that isn't necessarily there. You know, I, I think that we see that a lot, you know, like we even see healthy people, for example, if you take somebody like my build, you know, I'm probably right now walking around at seven and a half, eight percent body fat every day. Totally fine. I have a very eclectic diet. I eat a wide array of foods. My metabolic health is top notch. Why the fuck would I ever cut out carbs? You know what I mean? Like what what purpose does that serve me now? Because I I like to speak intelligently on these things. I have tried almost every diet that, you know, we're going to talk about. Um and I tried a keto diet. I, I lasted about two months and I, I'd never felt worse, man. I, I don't know. I don't know why you would ever choose to feel like that. It just, I lost anything explosive. I was trying to do um, anything performance related. I felt like I had zero fifth gear. I felt like it was just gradually sucking the life out of me. And that's essentially what it does. And people get trapped in this aesthetic pursuit and where they're willing to sacrifice long-term metabolic health for a short-term result, right? So that's what we do. We go on a keto diet. What's the goal of a keto diet? It's certainly not to live as healthy as we can as human beings because it's ludicrous. We don't know enough about it. There's hardly any actual long-term research. There can't be. It's too new, right? There's very little study on what, you know, the 15 year effects of putting your body through six months, a year of ketosis are going to be. So it, it's, it's this situation where we're trying to accomplish something in a short period of time. We're always looking for a quick expedited solution to every goddamn problem that we have in our lives where we are so much better off. If you just focus on your long-term overall metabolic health, and that doesn't have to mean excluding diets it's certain, or excluding certain foods. It certainly shouldn't mean that you should remove carbs from your diet. To me, that's, that's the craziest one. And, and I always, I, I just, I struggle with it so much because no matter how much research and reading I do on the low carb, no carb, keto front, like I just, I feel like there's such a lack of fundamental understanding of, of you know, sugar's role, for example, in the human body. Mm -hmm. And I, str I just struggle with it. I just, I, I think it's crazy. I, I don't think it's a good thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Like my, my biggest issue with elimination diets, um, because like you're right. A lot of the times people that are trying elimination diets, they're looking for that immediate kind of fix. They're looking to obviously lose a lot of weight, which again, that's a, that's a whole different perspective shift. Like why do you want to lose weight? Is it really the weight you want to lose? Most people just want to look better and feel better. It's not really the number on the scale that matters. So right off the bat, they have a completely different goal that really shouldn't be their goal, right? If they knew any better and had the um, you know, education provided to them, they'd understand that the scale, number on the scale isn't the big issue. It's how you look and how you feel, right? Um, yeah. So what we see when I find with elimination diets, it creates a very poor relationship with food, right? It's, we start kind of going black and white with things like carbs are bad, fats are good, too much protein's bad, too much pro protein's bad, good. You know, it's yep. back and forth or now you're, you're starting to exclude really important macronutrients and potential micronutrients from your system based on a completely misguided understanding of what role each of these macronutrients have in terms of giving you the health benefits and the performance benefits that you need to ultimately thrive in everyday life, in the gym, mentally, physically. So eliminating things without the knowledge of why you're doing so is very dangerous and it kind of creates this uphill battle and this yo-yo effect where your body's never going to really get what it needs to have a long-term healthy result. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I even, I put a post up, um, I, last week sometime where I, uh, somebody asked me, somebody DM me and they, they asked me the question. I said, are you are like you, are you anti-vegan? And I was like, 
I, I'm surprised I come across as that. Like I said, no, certainly not. I, I'm certainly not anti-vegan. I I've have currently and have privately consulted, trained, coached countless vegans and vegetarians. And I, I don't have to, you know, I said in the post, like I don't have to agree with somebody to try and help them. But I think even when it comes to a vegan diet, can you, can you live, can you, can you have a very healthy, well-rounded diet as a vegan? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can, but it, it takes far more effort. It really does. And, and I think, and I said in my post, and this is what like somebody wrote back, I can't remember what they wrote. I ended up in a brief conversation about it, but I just said like it, the, the biggest, the most important point to having a well-rounded vegan diet is going into a vegan diet with the fundamental understanding that there are puzzle pieces missing from the box. Right. And if, if you can, but the first step to correcting that is acknowledging that there are fucking pieces missing. Right. And I find that that and not to generalize, but I find often with vegans, that's the problem. You enter this conversation with them having the, the you know, the profound belief that by not eating meat, that they have made a they've made a good health decision. And and you can't try and convince them otherwise often. So it's it, it's trying to help a vegan understand that, like, you're you're starting this puzzle with pieces missing. So you need to acknowledge, first of all, that they're missing. If we just keep on saying, no, that's a complete puzzle. No, I got all the pieces. I got, no, everything's good. We got all the pieces. Like, you're, you're always going to end up with an incomplete puzzle. First step is acknowledging there are pieces missing. Figure out for you what those are. If you're a vegan, for example, incredibly important to get blood work done. Get a full blood panel done. You know, see what see what everything from your blood lipid to your your micro numbers are, and and get that data so you can look and go, okay, well, you know what? Maybe I'm maybe I'm iron deficient, maybe I'm B12 deficient, maybe I'm K2 deficient, like whatever it is, and you can try and correct that. But you you have to understand that by eliminating foods from your diet, you are creating holes in your health. Yeah. Absolutely. And that goes kind of, you would think it would go without saying, right? That if you're eliminating something, something's missing, right? Like you're not going to replace it with something else necessarily, but you got to find that, that really proper solution. So based on elimination, guys, let's we'll talk really quick. Let's we'll talk the role, right? Proteins are obviously essential for so many functions within the body. Um, obviously a big role, organ health and, and building lean muscle tissue and preserving lean muscle tissue, you know, increase your metabolic rate, great for bone density, strengthening the, the joints, all that kind of stuff. Carbs, obviously, is you know super effective for performance. And you know, to if we're a little bit too more too much cortisol in our system, right? They're good for regulating that hormone as well. Um, a lot of good stuff right there, right? I think I think that that is one of the often most often overlooked and most incredibly important points uh, when it comes to carbs and when it comes to sugars specifically. Um, the there has been so much, so much research to show, like, it's almost inarguable at this point that there is a correlation between sugar consumption and cortisol levels dropping, right? A reduction in cortisol. So the problem is when you take, and you see this in a lot of the data, when you take carbs and you take sugars out of the diet, you see a spike in cortisol, right? There is some clinical data to show that over time that that will kind of level out and cortisol levels will regulate themselves. But what we don't know is at what cost is that occurring then? Because the endocrine system is a phenomenally intricate system that even the, the, the and most intelligent experts on planet earth don't completely understand the relationships of certain hormones and how they interact with one another, right? So if you have, if you're taking something out of your diet, that's causing a negative spike, of a hormone, cortisol, for example, that then becomes anabolic to fat, catabolic to muscle growth. And then you com or you combine that almost always with a decrease in testosterone because they're kind of a teeter-totter, right? We all know that when cortisol levels drop, test levels typically drop or rise, test levels typically drop. So then by removing sugars, you have to, I'm not saying that you can't have a successful result temporarily on a keto diet, but that's like, you need to look at these things, right? Like you need to consider the consequence of removing sugar, for example, from your diet and what that's going to do long-term to that cortisol testosterone relationship, for example. Yeah. And understand what your goal is. What are you training for right now? If you're yeah. training for fat loss, which the majority of people are, right? They're looking to burn a lot of fat, create lean muscle tissue, and they're involving themselves in hit style workouts and they're doing a ton of volume. So their frequency in the gym is quite high and everything is at a fairly high intensity. 
your body at that stage of training needs the most amount of carbs. Like yeah. it just is what it is, man. If you're putting your body through that much stress, because again, exercise produces an acute stress, right? But if we don't supply it with the proper dietary, um, you know, I guess helpings, we're not going to reduce the, the, the cortisol and, the, and we're going to have more of a chronic elevated cortisol level, right? So we need to understand what are we trained for? What are we actually doing right now? And how do our, our dietary um, habits match what we're actually trying to achieve right now? And then there might be times where those phases, you know, interlude and you can lower your carb intake and you increase it or whatever it is, you can play around with it, but not knowing, you know, what your training looks like and, and what your goals are is going to leave you a little bit in the dark of what's the best approach for me currently right now. Yeah. Okay. My man, we live in a world where people gave up meat because they watched a Netflix documentary. So yes. this is how easily influenced people are. I have friends that gave up eating meat because of either what the health or game changers. And when they, t like, I'm just like, did you watch the other movie? What other movie? I don't know. The other one that says something different or did you just watch that one? No, I just watched that one. Oh, the one that says that if you eat meat, your blood, when you draw it, looks like motor oil. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah. Cause that's got like, it's, it was just so over the top nonsense that like, I, I was honestly like, there were times in the movie I was almost laughing out loud and thinking like, my God, if you're at home and you actually believe that this is true, you're a moron. Like you just, yeah. like it, it's, oh. prop it's propaganda, oh. right? You, you have oh, just, like you know, certain you know, films that are produced and budgeted from people that have a connection to that field of interest, yeah. right? Like, like, did you know that Game Cha Game Changers was co-produced by James Cameron, for example, who just prior to making the film, um, I don't quote me on the number, we'd have to look it up, but put like countless million dollars into a pea protein company. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. I'm not saying that he didn't believe in what he, the bullshit he was selling in the movie, but you know, is there an ulterior motive? How can there not be? Like, it, there's always a product, right? There's always a product behind a diet. There's a product behind the keto diet. There's a product behind the paleo diet. And the reason why it's keep put, it keeps getting pushed and it's in the media is because there's more and more books. There's more and more movies. There's more and more, like, you know, it's, it, you're just constantly bombarded with people trying to sell you shit. And anybody who's good at it is going to seem credible. They're going to seem legit. And the one thing that we seem to have got away from as a culture is paying attention to how the fuck we feel when we eat certain foods. You know what I mean? Like, how do you feel regardless of what, you know, Joe Smith says in his book that just because it has a, the letters MD beside it, you know, you assume that this guy knows his shit nutritionally, right? Just because it says it in his book, how do you feel when you, when you do this, when you're putting the work in, like, you know, if you remove carbs from your diet or your team, whatever your diet is, whatever this new experiment that you're, you're participating in is like, how are you gauging the result? And the one way that you can do that is by intensely working out, for example, right? But if, if the hardest thing that you do in a day is take the dog for a walk, it's really hard to determine whether or not you're benefiting from the dietary change that you've just made. You need to have some type of level of performance activity in your everyday routine to understand if your performance is suffering or it's improving, right? But that's another problem. It's just like, it, it's, it's never, it's just this cycle of, as I said before, people searching for solutions to problems that don't exist. It's crazy. Yeah. Long-term success at the end of the day, you want to have a healthy relationship with food. You want to have a well-balanced diet. You can't go wrong there, right? You're going to have way less metabolic you know, disruptions. You're going to feel way better. You're going to obviously be giving your body the nutrients it absolutely needs from all perspectives. And then from there, then you can start individualizing. If you need to decrease carbs, you need to increase carbs, you need to increase protein, decrease protein, whatever the case is from there, then get specific. All right, guys. Number two, excessive overdoing workouts. So again, we've talked a lot about cortisol, for example, so far. And like I said, you get that acute spike when you work out, when you exercise, right? You have that acute cortisol spike. Um, there comes a point though, you keep overdoing it. And you're someone who likes to go to the gym five, seven days a week, or you're, you know, you're a double hitter, right? You'll do what you'll do one class and then you'll stay for the next and you'll bang out another workout. And you're there for two to three hours straight. That's not necessary. Like it really isn't like the body works in a very kind of straightforward way, right? You stimulate the body, provide it some stress and stimuli with an external load or your body weight, whatever the case may be. 
and then you allow it to recover. And then with proper recovery with dietary, you know, habits and recovery practices, then you allow it to adapt appropriately, right? Get stronger, faster, uh, leaner, all that fun stuff. But if we keep doing more and more and more and throwing more fire or coal on the engine, whatever the hell you want to call it, your, your body doesn't get a chance to recover. doesn't get a chance to adapt. And at, for a lot of people, again, they restrict their growth hormone and their testosterone, and all these anabolic hormones, and they start releasing more of the catabolic hormones because they're constantly in this state of chronic stress. And it's just, it's just doing too much, right? So Matthew, take it away in terms of why people need to start thinking less is more. This, uh, the, the way that I try and coach this to people is, is you need to take more than just the, you know, the goal or the aesthetic goal or whatever is in, in, into account. So for example, bio-individuality of the human being can in great part determine the intensity and the length of time that that person can train for. Uh, also their age, you know, where they're, where they are in their life, what are their stresses, how stressful is their job, for example. And as you said, like if we get an acute cortisol spike from a measure of physical activity, then that person is at a, a stressful job all day where they're in charge of, you know, other people's money, for example, and they, they, they have that stress and then they're a father and they have kids and then they come to the gym and the, and the workout is just overly intense. It will be a negative result. Right. There is people have to they have to detach themselves from the notion of like maximal intensity leading to optimal growth. I think that would be a good way of putting it, you know, like try and detach yourself from that from that thought that maximal intensity all the time is going to lead to an optimal growth outcome because it will not. It will not. You should be training the vast majority of your time in the 75 to 80% effort range, right? You should not be, and there are different schools of thought and we could talk all day about different types of periodization and, and, and why they work and why they don't. But when you look at very educated coaches and how they train even elite level athletes, do you think elite level athletes are going to the field or the rink or the gym and they're training with maximal intensity every day they go in there? That's outrageous you know like even sprinters that's all they do that's all they compete at sprinters sprint maybe two days a week they're not sprinting maximal effort for extended periods of time six days a week they're just gonna they can't they, 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 they couldn't do it absolutely you can't and you'll get hurt you know even it, like you'll suffer metabolically you will you'll, you'll suffer injuries that will set you back as an athlete but i think that that's the that's the biggest thing like people want this result right and it's this weird, it's this kind of weird paradox where we have on one hand, you got this group of people that, and you'll always have them, that feel like, you know, the more effort they put in, the better the result is going to be. Because we've always been told that since we were little kids, like the harder you work, the better the result, the more effort you put in, the more reward you're going to reap, right? That's not, that's not necessarily true. Effort in terms of fitness can be taking time to do something that's a little bit more slow, but necessary, for example, like some mobility work or some stretching. Often your time would be better spent doing that. So the performance in the workout the coming few days is going to be elevated as opposed to spending 30 minutes, an additional 30 minutes at the end of your workout where your effort level is shit because fatigue has become a dramatic factor. You're compromised while you're working out. Your lifts are going to shit. Like just spend that time doing something more intelligent. And I promise you, you will benefit from that more than you will trying to just work, 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 work all the time. Yeah. From a psychological standpoint, that's tough for people to understand, right? Like it is. They, they, they're programmed to think, you know, the, the harder I work out, the heavier weight I lift, the better for me. And yeah, to an extent that makes sense, but you can't take that and multiply it by added frequency, right? You got to play that game. So an external, like a, external stresses matter, man. Like, so for example, if you take somebody who's an elite level athlete, you take an NHL hockey player, or a UFC fighter or something like that. And that is their job. That's their focus of their life, right? Yes. They can train for two and a half, three hours a day because a, their bodies are designed to do that by that, that point in their life. Yeah. But have constant access to treatment. Like that's the biggest difference, right? With people who are professional athletes. Yeah. They can train for extended periods of time, but they also immediately 
are hopping into cold tubs, getting massages, getting therapeutic work done. They have access to anything that they need. And as a human being, as Joe, who sells life insurance in Toronto and then goes and crushes it at the gym for two and a half hours after work, we know the motherfucker doesn't stretch. You know, he might get in the sauna with all the other old naked dudes for 10 to 15 minutes and think that it's going to limber him up. And then he goes home, goes to bed, gets up, gets in his car, sits all day, gets back in his car, takes a shit and sits, goes and eats dinner and sits back to the gym and then rips a 400 pound deadlift. Joe, you're out of your mind, bro. You're out of your mind. Like, I like this <laughs> Joe guy. I like his intensity. You, just, but, you know what I mean? But that's that's so many people, right? Like, that's so many people. Yeah. And it's just crazy. It's like you don't need to spend that much time working physically if the rest of your life is even relatively on point. Yeah. So a good way to approach this, a good kind of solution to this in terms of if you are now, for me, I love going to the gym, right? It's tough to not find me in a gym on a day. So if I, but I don't want to go in, I don't want to shoot in either. Right. So a good approach is to set your intention. So, so, so you go into the workout knowing what you want to accomplish, because I have a plan. Because if I go in there with my ego, I'm going to be like, yes. man, I'm going to bang today and I'm going to lift, I'm going to crush weight. So I might say, Hey, Monday, Wednesdays and Saturdays are my go-to high intensity days. Intensity means weight guys, not how yeah. fast I go. It actually means weight. So I'm going to have a high intensity day where I'm going to push my body. Maybe, you know, it's, let's just say in a circuit type workout or a class environment, I'm going to go really hard with my workout from a more hypertrophy. You know, you're in a solo gym environment. That might be my heavy squats, my deadlifts, my bench presses and all that fun stuff. Then the other days I'm having the intention to say, okay, I can't go hard like I did on Monday. So I'm going to supply myself with a mobility day where I might do a trigger session, which is to get some blood flow get some oxygen to the muscle and release some lactic acid, that kind of stuff, get rid of the waste in my muscle, but keep the body moving, do some stretch work. So my intention then is I want to be strong and better for my Wednesday workout, right? I want to heal up and I want to feel good for my Wednesday workout. So when I go in there, I'm not, I'm putting my ego aside and I, I, and I'm eliminating the opportunity for me to get all jacked up on going heavy and hard, hard that day because I know that's not what I'm trying to accomplish on this particular workout. This is a different thing I'm trying to do. Yeah. I, um, it, what it, it, you said so many things in there that just boil down to like going into going into the gym prepared, just have a plan, have a plan, you know, like I am, I am a very spontaneous person. Like, you know, we know each other. Well, I like to just do shit at the drop of a hat. I don't like to plan every moment of my day, but I will never enter a workout without knowing what I'm going to do. It's a waste of time. And you see that's like, you, you go into a good life, just stand in the corner, you know, put a camera on it and just watch how many guys just step into the free weight area and just start looking around, man. You know, they're just like, what's you know, they're available? Looking, what's available. They're looking for ideas, right? And then the problem with looking for ideas is you ultimately will always gravitate to what you're good at because no one's going to go, ah, I'm going to try out something new that might make me look like an ass in front of that hot chick over there. You know, it's just, you get stuck in these patterns. And I think if I were to honestly say that the, the biggest mistake that most, particularly men will say everybody, but particularly men make when they go into the gym is that they train in only the sagittal plane. Right. It's like it's just one dimensional. Like it's just up, down, forward, back, up, down, forward, back, in and out, up and down, just the whole workout. And all those exercises are great, but they don't really lead to great development if that's all you're doing. Right. Like deadlifts, back squats, bench presses, curls, bent rows, lunges, all that shit. Fantastic. It's all the same fucking direction. Right. Like how often do you see you a will, guy? Now you will put on fantastic muscle with that. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely. But Listen, I'm not saying don't do that. Absolutely. Yeah. You need to do this. You know, like I'm so I was a I, I was a competitive Olympic lifter. Like my whole yeah. goal in the gym was two lifts, you know, but but that's that's the problem with most people's development. And they limit their growth because they only train doing one thing. Like how many guys do you honestly see, man, doing anything rotational? in a workout, whether it's even either like cable twists or throwing medicine balls or whatever, ax chops, anything like taking a bar in a landmine and fl you know, like what, there's so many different national row, but you never see that shit. People train in straight lines. And that's a great opportunity that one of your days can be, Hey, I'm going to do rotational work. 
right? Rotational work. I'm going to do yeah. things like we're, we're going to get into a topic in, in a little bit, but different exercises that you can incorporate in your routine that are, you know, specifically designed to work on different planes of motion and get you strong in different positions. And they're really functional positions, actually. If you think about your body, how often are we robotically walking forward and back? Yeah, there's certain things that we do, obviously, but there's a lot of times that we're rotating, we're picking things up from the side, putting yeah, man. Things down. We're constantly it's real life shit. Body that, that way. So it will benefit you guys. Um, so yeah, definitely make sure that we're taking that time. Because remember, if you keep going, 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 not only will the results suffer, but you're going to be fatigued. You're going to have a lot of neurological damage. You're going to have problems sleeping, which is going to affect our recovery, um, recovery issues right here. And your metabolic rate will go down, right? Because your body's being told. If I were someone to go do three classes in a row or stay at the gym for three hours, I'm probably going to burn a lot of calories, but that what happens is our body's going to adapt because it's going to say, and this person, like, how can I try to build muscle when I'm constantly asking the body to take calories away? Like muscle is a very expensive tissue and we're not going to increase our metabolic rate when I constantly keep doing a workout, right? That's why that long distance runners, they're not very muscular individuals because they can't afford to have that tissue there because it's too expensive and they're going to burn way too many calories on a long distance run. Same thing if I keep trying to hang out at a gym for two to three hours or I'm constantly trying to push the limits. Okay, guys. Yeah. Okay. Number three, under eating to improve. If you're watching this on film, I just did quotations around improve, but under eating to improve body composition. So this is the idea that, hey, I want to look better. So I'm going to eat less and I'm going to eat less than less and i'm going to keep eating less and that is uh antiquated solution to what you're trying to accomplish and, and i'm not saying reducing your calories won't have you lose weight right it, it can and it probably will if i'm eating 3,000 calories for maintenance and all of a sudden i start eating 1500 yeah i'm gonna slim down i'm gonna lose some weight now in terms of improving body composition and long-term health effects, it's not going to be very effective. When I think of body composition, it's looking better. It's looking stronger, it's looking more defined, more toned, more symmetrical, right? I don't want to just lose weight and lose a whole bunch of muscle. That doesn't make my body composition, composition look any better than it does right now. So under eating, thinking you're doing yourself a service, you're actually doing yourself a disservice. And I'm sure Matt can um, reiterate right now, when I work with clients, I'm telling you 80% of the time right now, when I work with an average client that's not obese, the problem isn't overeating. It is under eating food. It is under eating protein. Their, their protein um, consumption is probably 100 grams to 70 grams less than it needs to be. So it's under consuming those important macronutrients that the body needs to build and, and again, we, we're trying to build muscle tissue. Lean muscle tissue is our friend because why? I just talked about it. It's very expensive tissue. So we're going to naturally increase our metabolic rate. It means we get to burn more calories at rest compared to having to constantly manually burn calories. And like Matt was saying, if you're someone who's working at a desk all day long, and you have one hour to work out, it would be pretty beneficial if your body can automatically burn calories when you're just doing your everyday stuff, like sitting at a desk. I will say, I will say this because I, I think a lot of this goes back to what I was saying before, when it boils down to in the quest of a short term goal, you create a long term problem. Right. But I think we just need to put like the idea that you can get strong or build muscle on a limited calorie diet is just insane. It, <laughs> it, I don't, I don't know how to say it. Like you are a living, breathing, growing thing. Has anybody ever had a pet? Has anybody ever had a fucking plant, a tree, anything? You find me one thing on planet Earth that gets stronger or bigger when you don't feed it. Anything. Anything. You, as Mark and Jill at home in your living room, are not going to be the first two living creatures on Earth 
who are going to get stronger, bigger, better, faster by feeding yourself less. Here's, here's, the, here's the problem. You're 100% right. But when you just said the more, majority of people are going to hear that and go, well, I don't want to get bigger. I don't want to get stronger. I don't want to get faster. They're, they're, I just want to lose fucking weight or look better. Okay, so then, let's, thing, let's put it this way. You, you want to look better and you want to perform and feel better. And what Matt just said is going to get you looking and feeling better, guys. I don't Absolutely. care. It just is what it is. The more muscle mass you put on, the more metabolically active you become. And I know we all know that, but that's an important point. And going back to what you were saying before, where you have to eat, like you have to consume calories. And the problem with, with people's development is, is more often than not under eating, not overeating. And it's really hard. This is one of the most difficult things to have a conversation about. It's so hard to convince people of this. It's so hard to convince somebody that's trying their best to lose weight and hasn't been successful that the reason that they're not successful is because they're limiting themselves too much. That's a really difficult concept for most people to understand. And I don't think we have time on this podcast to go into an intricate discussion on why that is, but you need when it comes to if we're speaking specifically on growth and I understand that was a fair point where you said like a lot of people are going to hear that and say like well I'm not looking to get bigger I'm not saying bigger I'm saying stronger and if you aren't looking to con if you're not constantly in the pursuit of performance growth or strength growth as a human being physical mental what that whatever that may look like for you I'm not interested in being your coach so I'm not on here trying to appeal to somebody who's trying to be as skinny or as thin as possible like I don't give a fuck about them quite frankly like I'll love you as a human being outside the gym but your goal to be as low body fat and as little as you possibly can so you can fit into the newest pair of skinny whatever the fucks I don't care I don't want any part of your fitness journey that's not what I want I will help you if it's in a group environment, but if I'm being totally honest, I find those people boring. I find you boring. If your only goal is to be skinny, you suck. You're boring, right? Get a, prof- I, I just, I can't, you know, like I, I can't, like it, it, it's just such a, it's such a sad way to live your life. You know what I mean? Like when we were talking earlier about fad diets or about uh, elimination diets, like the, the, you know how many people will lose 15 pounds, put it back on, lose 30 pounds, put back on 20, lose 25. Who gives a fuck? Seriously, like who cares? That's not an accomplishment. Anybody can do that. And any coach, no matter how limited their experience is, can help an overweight person lose 15 to 20 pounds. So because your friend's personal trainer helped your overweight friend lose 30 pounds, that does not make them good at their job. That does not mean that they know what the hell they're talking about or can help you. Right. But man, yeah, I could go, I I could go on for hours on this. It's just, it's, it's so crazy to me that that is ever a goal of a human being. Your goal as a human being should be stronger. Life gets better in every regard. When you increase your physical and your mental strength, your well being as a human being improves. Stop trying to make yourself weaker by making yourself skinnier. It's a terrible goal. If that, and I said, if that's your goal, if your goal is to be as skinny as possible, good on you, live your life. I want no part of your fitness journey. And guys, that's good stuff. Matt and I as coaches, if I'm dealing with somebody who wants to lose 20 to 30 pounds, 15 to 30 pounds, whatever the range is, within the first couple of months, a proper coach isn't going to want to see that scale move too much. If you think within the first three months and you're working with myself or you're working with Matt that we want you to drop 15 pounds in three months, like you're mistaken. I do not want to see that scale because guess what? we're not putting on 15 pounds of muscle in three months. And that's a, that's a poor exchange right there. I want to have a fairly even exchange of fat loss and muscle gain. So that might look like we lose five to 10 pounds of fat in three months. And we put on five to 10 pounds of muscle in three months. Now let's just say five to make it easier, right? So five and five. So in three months, we put on five pounds of muscle and we took off five pounds of fat. It's a phenomenal exchange. And guess what happens on the scale? Zero. Because we added five, we took five away. So your weight stays the same. But guess what? You look way better. You feel way better. You're much stronger mentally and physically. So understanding and adopting the idea that, hey, me losing weight 
is not helping my body composition. We need to get rid of that, right? We'll lose weight over time because guess what? When you put on muscle, like Matt and I have discussed with this podcast, you were going to increase your resting metabolic rate. So you're going to burn more calories at rest. And if you're someone who's like, I want to burn more calories. Okay, let's get you on a good, healthy, balanced diet. And if anything, which we're going to get into our next topic, increase passive, very low stress cardio, go for walks, go outside, walk, right? <laughs> you want to burn an extra 200, 300 calories a day. Don't reduce your calories. Go, go walk, go walk for 45 minutes a day, 60 minutes a day. Tell me how damn good you feel. The vitamin D, the fresh air, the nature, you're going to burn your excess two to 300 calories just doing that by itself. And you're not reducing or restricting yourself from proper nutrients your body needs to grow. Just that simple. Uh, let me let me piggyback before we move on real quick off of what you just said, because I think it's important because I've, I've mentioned a few times how people are looking for, you know, solutions to problems that don't exist or more importantly, that they're trying to they're trying to get a short term result while compromising the long term integrity of their health. Right. So when you were just talking about the typical weight loss ratio or the fact that you're not interested or I wouldn't say I don't want to see the scale move down. I don't really care if it does, though. I think that's what I would say about my clients. Like in the first month, if, if they're not dropping weight, and, they, and there's a and there's that fair exchange of fat to muscle growth. I'm totally fine with that scale not moving. If we take a look though at something like a a, three, a, a typical three month casual workout, change your diet. Let's start getting you more leaning towards a healthier life, right? Typical three month result, you'll see like 15 to 20 pounds of weight loss, and you might see like four to five pounds of muscle growth. That's in a typical well coached healthy adult that's not dedicating two hours a day to this. They're just eating better and working out more often with somebody who knows their shit, right? So you take that result. That result has more integrity, holds up better over time in terms of your long-term metabolic health, right? That person has done it right. They're taking time to create those slow, controlled, sustainable adaptations. And the result at the end of that means a better balance of muscle to fat, which then makes you more metabolically active and then takes you another step towards the overall goal. To me, what is my overall goal at any time is metabolic health, not how light I can be, not my body fat. What I want is to be able to live my life at a comfortable, healthy body fat without walking around every day, counting every goddamn calorie I eat, every gram of carbs I eat. Does this have sugar in it? Oh my God, does this have honey. I had three grams of sugar earlier today. That's going to take me like what, how can I, I don't, I don't get how you can live like that. I would rather put in a steady amount of consistent work over a longer period of time and to get an easy, sustainable, enjoyable result. Makes sense. Makes sense. Absolutely. And like I said, what Matt was saying, jumping off that, yeah, if I'm dealing with someone who wants to lose 5, 10 pounds, like that's not a big goal for me, right? We're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. We're going to start off slow. And, and again, if you put it in terms of like, hey, we're going to work around maintenance off the bat, slow, lower it by a couple hundred calories, so we're a little bit of in a deficit, whatever happens, happens at that point. You know, we're going we're gonna to have all the same practices. We're going to try to promote strength training. We're going to promote really proper sleep and stress management techniques. Whatever happens, happens. Like we're going to go in the right direction eventually. Like everything, we're doing all the right shit. So we don't need to worry about the result. Like Matt said, if it's five pounds of fat loss and two pounds of muscle gain, phenomenal. That might not be in your personal genetic makeup for this to happen. It might be a one and one exchange or two and two. But if you happen to lose a little bit more fat using the same exact principles Matt uses and I use, phenomenal, right? But over time, trust the process. I guarantee you're going to see a phenomenal result. You guys, this is a good point to take a break right now. And we're going to jump into number three and or four and five when we get back. Okay, guys, back at it. That was for our sponsor break. <laughs> Still looking for one. So if you know one, let us know. <laughs> Number four, guys, using stationary cardio equipment properly. So um, often, you, you, you know, Matt and I will, well, at least I'll, I'll, I'll say myself, I'll chirp people that are just doing static cardio all the time. Just because it's like, usually they're doing it not based on, they're not trying to become like this cardio machine right they're not trying to become someone who's running marathons or ultras or doing triathlons they're just doing cardio because they think it's actually like really helping their body composition like this is the right thing i need to be doing and it's again it's just that mistaken understanding education or lack of education that is limiting their results um but that doesn't mean that there's not an appropriate way to use these stationary cardio pieces of equipment now 
what are those pieces of equipment? You can look at a, a rower, you can look at an elliptical, um, a treadmill, a spin bike, Matthew Bacon's favorite, a spin bike. Um, what's the one like the with the, with the arms, Matt, and the and the the elliptical, the airdyne? The, the, yeah, the airdyne. Um, so there's those are kind of stationary ones, and that now there's a really good way to use these right now. Like we talked about earlier, if we're looking for a therapeutic trigger session or in between session, right? It's a great opportunity to jump on a stationary piece of equipment just to kind of get that blood flow um, and that oxygen into the muscle, right? Great way to do that. Um, in terms of fat burning, I would much rather see interval training, right? Obviously that just can be a way more effective rate for you to burn fat without increasing cortisol. Uh, and without losing or losing muscle, right? The idea is to obviously preserve muscle if we're going to do a hit class like that, or we can have a nice exchange where we're, we're doing the hit kind of workout on one of these stationary things like a sprint on a treadmill, for example. We're actually probably going to maybe build a little, little, bit, little bit of muscle there, right? So there's a proper way to use these depending on your goals, but just staying on a bike for an hour pedaling in one cadence isn't really good. It's not really doing you much good. And I'll let Matt take take off on this one because i know we had a post recently talking about spin bikes and the community came oh, at me man came yeah. at me hard. the the pellet the peloton army came after me it was uh peloton. now i don't know i don't know what the peloton workouts look like so i'm not gonna pretend that i do know and it might be, I've seen it might it, I've be seen a good it. one is it good listen man they're, they are what they are there's there's you know the vast majority of them revolve around a spin bike that's that's the product okay. right they, they have st- there there are times like granted there are times when they get them off the bike and they'll do some push-ups and shit but so how do know. we use these pieces of equipment most effectively for the average person who's looking to keep a preserved lean muscle tissue um get back to a nice tough session have some good recovery and maximize fat burning potential i i think Okay, so so let let's start with like if your thing is treadmill running, yeah, I don't want to take it away from you, right? Like I, if your thing, if you really love going into the gym and running on the treadmill for forty five minutes, and that's an escape for you, please don't let anything that I say or that you say, you know, kind of knock that from your life. Like go in if that's a therapeutic regimen for you, then then I would I would absolutely support it because it's certainly not going to. It's not going to, some light jogging on a treadmill is not going to hinder your growth. It's just not going to really do anything for you, right? Like there's so much, like say you're going into the gym and you're one of those people who should be in the gym for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes tops. If you have a, you know, a family and you you need to expedite your workout time, there's just so much more that you could be doing and spending your time on that would be so much more beneficial to you regardless of what your goal is. So that's where I have a problem with, you know, kind of extended steady state cardio in gyms. It's like when you're looking, what's the goal? Okay. The goal of most people is either weight loss or strength gain, right? Or muscle gain, weight loss or growth or muscle gain for very few lucky people. It's performance related. No matter what's one of those avenues you're looking at steady state indoor cardio is not, it's not advantageous for the result, right? If your goal is to lose weight, I can give you 50 better things to do. Right? If your goal is to build muscle, certainly you don't want to be jogging on a treadmill or spending your time on a spin bike. If your goal is to get stronger, well, we don't even need to talk about it because you're not going to get any stronger. You're not going to get any better at doing anything on a spin bike aside from spinning, right? So where can we use them? We can use them for very specific methods of development. For example, spin bikes. I don't have a problem with spin bikes. And I said this to a few people. I'm like, you're, you're saying that I'm trashing spin. I'm not trashing spin bikes. I'm not trashing that they, 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 everybody got so offended. Here's why everybody got so offended with that. All the Peloton people. And this is for you. If you're listening right now, you weren't actually disagreeing with what I was saying. You were fucking pissed at yourself for spending $4,000 on a piece of equipment. You're already sick of, and you're trying to convince yourself that it was a good purchase because your <laughs> wife or your husband is bitching at you every day for that dumb thing that doesn't get used in the basement. So that's why you were angry. So don't take it out on me. Right. But you can use a spin bike very effectively on, for example, if you are training an athlete in a a very power oriented sport and you're using that to do some interval sprint work, you know, fantastic use of a spin bike. Same thing with an athlete who runs or even, you know, a hockey player on their feet, something like that. You can do use treadmills to do phenomenal sprint work. 
right? But to just hop on them when your goal is weight loss, I think a lot of people just hop on them, man, because they run out of ideas. I really do. Because I think a lot of people just go and they don't know what else to fucking do. So they just, they go in, and they jog, you hey, know, man, you don't need to learn how to run or ride a bike really. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're, we grow up doing these things. So yeah. it's, it's easy. It's comfortable. Like there's no technique involved. That's go a under, very good point. Get yeah. under a bar and do a proper squat. And that's just hard. Like that yeah. takes mobility. It takes strength. It takes, you know, uh, working on imbalances. Like you need to really perfect that form. There's so many mechanical issues that can go wrong. So you don't do it because you don't know how to do it or you can't do it. Yeah. In bike, it's easy. That's why you see is on the outside of the gyms, you're in your own little bubble basically. And it's, it's easy. It's comfortable. And, and you get a good workout if you do it right. Cause you, cause you're, well, you get a good workout in terms of that you get a sweat going and then you see, yeah. the calories, you see 500 calories burn. Oh my God, dude. I can crush 500 calories when I get home within three minutes with a protein shake, right? Yeah. If you want to do stuff that is increasing your metabolic rate. If you think the 600 calories that you burn during a cardio session is as effective as burning 300 during a strength training session or 200, but not taking into consideration the increased resting rate that your calories may burn, like you're, you're, you're horribly mistaken, right? Like you can't just, because again, where does it end? You just keep doing more cardio just because eventually your body adapts right and chances are if you're doing a whole bunch of cardio to lose weight and burn fat you're probably in a deficit so guess what when you're in a deficit and you're trying to lose excess calories through a stationary cardio equipment your body will say hey man we're already only eating 1300 calories now you want to burn excess 600 like we're not going to do that so your body is really good at preserving and yeah. they did a really cool study that they followed a tribe I don't know, somewhere that they're a hunter gatherer tribe, right? And all day long, they're on their feet, they're moving, they're running, they're gathering, they're, they're taking them prey. So you would think these guys would burn a shit ton of calories, but guess what? They don't eat a lot of food. So they got really good at preserving their calorie expenditure. So yeah. they were only burning like a very average amount of calories per day, even though they're on their feet all day long, because guess what? They didn't have a lot of muscle mass and they couldn't afford to have all those calories just spit out of their body yeah but let's be very let's be very clear to anybody listening at home that's not you that is not you it's not going to be you so you're not going to have a successful <laughs> athletic gym career by reducing your, your calories yeah Dap six months so yeah yeah so the best ways i say it i say recovery is one of them um so increased work capacity i could use it on my off days or post-workout just as a general just kind of keep my legs flowing uh, and it can yep. increase your work capacity in the strength session tomorrow um cool downs removal of lactic acid and waste um 10 minutes shows great results if yep. you yep. after that's walking on incline hiking just simple stuff nothing stressful to the body and then but the important the important thing there was 10 minutes right when you said 10 minutes that's it don't hop on there for 40 that's not no. you know you don't need, you need 10 10 minutes walking at, at a brisk pace and you're gonna remove all that lactic acid for the majority i think it's like 68 percent just remove within the first um like three minutes or or and then the rest in the 10 minutes or something and then you have fat burning finishers i like them as if you want to do like a tabat or you want to do a 30 and 30 30 on 30 hell on. yeah you know what bang out four six minutes of that eight minutes of that i'm telling you that's probably gonna be the hardest thing you do all day long all week long probably if you're doing it properly if you're doing it right and that 30 seconds is a hard 30 seconds you'll be killer hey yep. guys Final one here, uh, five common fitness and health trends that need fixing. Um, this is a cool one. I really like this one because Matt kind of obviously uh, prefaced it earlier, but lifts you don't do but should do. So I'll just kind of start off with the general big functional movements I think everybody should do, and this might be obvious. Um, and we'll get Matt to go into more specifics and talk about rotation a little bit. Um, but I like the idea of you know a push, uh, a, a squat, a hinge, uh, a press, right? A pull, sorry. So the big movements, and if you're not doing them, you should definitely invest time into because again, they're the biggest movements and the best bang for your buck. They're going to release the most amount of you know, growth hormone, testosterone, um, squats. So many different variations, obviously. Majority of people probably do them, um, but you got to make sure they're in all your workouts, right? And to some degree, there's a lot of fun ways to do it. Um, I like, you know, a vertical press, Um because again, it's a very functional movement, right? We're putting boxes away, putting things in cupboards. Um, a deadlift, when you know how to do it properly, again, a lot of different variations of it. Um, it's a good hinge as well, a row. Um, typically, I, I like the bent row. 
um, if you're doing it properly as well, because it engages the biceps, really kind of hits the back, works on a good hip hinge position as well. I would suggest pull-ups and chin-ups. Uh, unfortunately, the majority of people can't do a chin-up or pull-up, right? So, you know, to say those, that's a functional movement you absolutely need to do. Um, obviously, you can work your way up into it. But uh, until then, I kind of chill out a little bit or you know, some, you know, work on the development through negatives. Um, bench press, chest press, obviously the most bang for your buck in terms of a press, more of a horizontal press. Um, and then when you can do it really well, and this does take technique, I love the kettle, <clears throat> excuse me, the kettlebell swing as a conditioning tool and, and the great hip hinge movement pattern. I think it's probably one of the best bang for your buck strength and conditioning movements I'll use and incorporate with my clients and myself in terms of preserving muscle mass or putting some lean tissue on and actually building the strength while burning fat. So I really like that movement, uh, a part of my repertoire. And those are kind of like the big basis that I, I definitely go to when I'm starting out with a client. And if you were to do those three days a week, um, you're going to get a, a massive result. But I'll let Matt kind of dive into lifts you should do that you're definitely not doing because they're, they're really hard, very technical, very mechanical, but they're very effective. Yeah, let's go. I'll take it into things. Let's go things that you should do that you're probably not doing. Number one, jump. Jump. Train your jumping ability. Jump. Please, for the love of God, jump. As a human, you need to be able to do it, right? It's it's non-negotiable. You have to be able to jump. And not many people... Um, as a, a consistent part of their training have, you know, broad jumps, Bach jumps, vertical jumps, all like combination jumps. And, and that's real life stuff, man. So, so add jumps in. So we won't go into more detail than that, but um, one of my favorite exercises for strength development in the world is a Turkish getup. I, I love Turkish getups and not many people, people don't do them and not because they don't like them. They don't do them because they've never been taught. And so that would be, a, a, that would be one little tiny piece of advice that I would give you go out, Get some good instruction on how to perform a proper Turkish getup. Um, What's the benefit, right. Matt? There is so much different mechanical movement that goes into one lift, right? Like when you look at the starting position and just, just to be able to get posted up onto the forearm, then up onto the palm is a chore alone. Like what is what would be known as a typical half getup, right? But then to elevate that hip with a significant amount of weight over top of your body, where you look at the stress is placed, you know, you kind of have that T column from the dumbbell to the posted arm on the floor with kind of the hip off, there's just so much brilliant abdominal activity and there's so many moving parts and moving components to it. So you're forced to kind of work around a weight where in most other exercises, you're manipulating the weight to you, right? Like in most exercises, when we're rowing, when we're pressing, when we're pulling, right? We're, we're manipulating the weight. When we have a Turkish getup, the weight's basically staying constant. It's staying put because as soon as it drifts, you're fucked, right? So you're manipulating your body and you're learning mechanically how to move your body around a weight. And it's a fantastic exercise because of that, because those are hard to find. Um, number three, uh, kind of playing off of that is spend time over your head. And most guys, a lot of most guys, most people don't. Most people, you said it already, and I absolutely agree with you. Most people do not do enough press work, right? They focus on pushing away from their body. And they don't do enough press work. If you can't, I, I would say this, if you're, a, if you're a guy who works out regularly and you cannot at least push press your body weight, there's something wrong with you. You need to train better. Like you need to, you need to focus on your overhead work if that's you, right? And I'm not knocking it. It's just most people don't train over their head enough. So they're not strong enough over their head. And then they, they start over time limiting or becoming limited in their shoulder mobility because they're not used to carrying much weight over their head. And then on top of that, right, the most, essentially the most vulnerable, if you think about it, the most vulnerable state that the human body can be in is what? Fully extended, right? If somebody was going to hit you, what would you do? If somebody was going to punch you in the stomach, what would you curl everything in, right? Because it's your most protective state. It's the strongest position you can be in. Athletically speaking, strongest position we can be in is in tight, knees bent, butt back, ready to move, right? So it stands to reason that the most vulnerable position the human body can be in is a fully extended state with a weight overhead, right? So if we're looking at that, if we can accept that, then it also stands to reason that if we train ourselves to be strong, in our most vulnerable state, that's going to translate quite nicely over into strength in our more controlled or more athletic domains. Love it. 
I love it. Um, and the one thing I would add into it, which is, uh, again, the, all these the things Matt kind of mentioned are a little bit more uh, advanced. You have to work on Like, it's a skill. Like, I mean, you're not just going to go tomorrow and do a Turkish getup. Like, you could do it and be really bad, really shitty. But, yeah, get some instructional video. Guys, like, you have an access right here. Matthew Bacon, you can contact and you can message. And I guess what we're here for. We're coaches. We're trainers. We're, we're wellness and fitness educators. Like, we're here as a resource for you guys. Um but I would say, I would say getting into sprinting because how many people, like, I couldn't even yeah. imagine somebody like a 35 year old and that, and like, you can't sprint, man. A 35 year old is not doing any work. If they try to sprint, they are going to pull a hamstring. Yeah. They're going to blow a hamstring. Like, yeah. they are on him. This isn't just like me hyperbole, I'm not exaggerating, but if I throw this guy on a hundred meter track, right. He's going to do a hundred meter sprint. I guarantee by 50 meters in this dude's hammies are going to blow the fuck up. Like it is the <laughs> real deal and like unfortunately when he was 17 and when he was 14 he probably would just get out of bed and just book it maybe not 17 but maybe 10 and 12 right you can get out you can sprint at any point and slowly but surely you start degrading your body becomes super susceptible to injury um and, and muscle strains and pulls and tears you don't do it for so long but it's so effective it's so natural so habitual so um biological like we always take running for granted but learn how to sprint, right? Because it's, it's, it's just good to do, right? It's, it's very powerful movement, um, requires a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers, which is great for muscle development, uh, a, lot, a lot of hypertrophy there, great fat burning tool. If you want to do it in a safe way, if you're someone who hasn't sprinted all, in a little while, don't go to a flat surface, don't go to a turf, don't go to a track. That's just a recipe for disaster. Um, do something that a little bit more of an incline, right? You can start off on a treadmill incline and do more like walking, hiking, and kind of working your way there or hills right? Um, usually a softer surface, naturally the incline is going to slow you down, which is going to limit that hundred percent pace that you're at. Um, it's a little bit safer, right? You're, you're way less prone to injury. So it's something you got to work your way up to just like any of these exercises are, you're not going to just jump out of bed if you've never done them before and be great at it tomorrow. It takes time, but learning those things, I love how Matt categorized it, right? Like the jumping and, and the rotating and, and the overhead and the running. It's just, those, those are human behaviors that we're all just we, we should be able to do at, at, a, at a moment's notice because it's evolutionary, right? We have to be able to, yeah, we're maybe we're not getting uh, chased by a saber-toothed tiger anymore that we got to get the hell out of there. But at the same token, it's just good to be able to do. There's just, a, there's just certain things as, as a, like somebody who's trying to be an athlete. And this is, this is very much for people who are in, you know, the younger years of their life from, you know, 20 to 45 or 50 or whatever that is even beyond. But like, there's like, if you, to me, this is just me. And there's people that would probably think this is ridiculous, but if you can bench press 450 pounds, but you can't do a somersault, that's hilarious. It's just hilarious. Don't be that guy. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be the person who's strong, who's the best, strongest version of themselves, but you can still move. Right. But I think that's the thing, man. Strength is that it's movement, right? It, it's, if you have the definition of strength of being, I can just, you know, push yeah. 400 off my chest or I can squat 600. Yeah. That's a form of strength, but real mental physical strength is a well-oiled ecosystem. And like you said, being able to run and jump and somersault and roll and, and move and protect yourself. That's, that's real strength, right? That is everyday strength that you're, you're never going to not rely on. 100%. That was good stuff. All that right, guys, like always, you can check this podcast out. Fear Being Average on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You're probably listening to it on one of those platforms right now, so I don't need to tell you that. But this episode in particular is being recorded, so I'm going to throw it on my YouTube page at Brandon Rick at 365 Check it out. So if you want to see our face, you want to see how this Matthew Bacon guy actually looks, how big and tall and strong is he? You know, like he's pretty impressive, but let's actually see this guy in person. Um, you can check it out right there in, in his hoodie. Uh, you can obviously follow me on Instagram at Brandon Rick 365. You can check out my website, Brandon Rick 365.com where I have fitness programs, nutrition programs. Uh, you can join my true coach coaching app as well, where he give you some good basic workouts to do to crush it right now. Matthew Bacon, you can find him at, Coach underscore Matthew Bacon on Instagram. Uh, just my name on Facebook. Best place. 180 Wellness is my clinic. Yeah, guys, if you want any mobility work, we really uh, obviously talked about it in this set, in this little podcast here, but those therapeutic sessions or trigger sessions in between your big workouts. Um, and again, don't think of it as um, 
you doing mobility once you get hurt. Use it as a preemptive tool, right? So you don't get hurt. That's going to be way cheaper and way more effective and way healthier to do, right? So use those tools for your advantage before you actually really, really need them. Yeah, it's going to do you a great service and going to add a lot of longevity and health span to your life. All right, guys, great episode. We'll see you on the next one. Peace. Woo! Bye.